Hey, everyone, people are still kind of struggling in, but we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so first of all, thank you so much, everybody, for joining the webinar. Uh, this is our first Mission Cares for Tourism um, Lunch and Learn. Uh, my name is Jess Loading. I'm the Director of Sustainability for Shupan, uh, and I'm also a board member for Michigan Cares for Tourism. Uh, Michigan Cares is a 100% volunteer, 100% give back uh, organization that brings together industry professionals for volunteerism events um, around the state of Michigan. Um, today, we have a great presentation uh, of experts across the state um, for you today on how to leverage our historical sites um, in order to drive tourism to our areas and preserve and protect what makes Michigan Pure Michigan. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the Peer Award nominations are now live. Uh, the Peer Award uh, was created all the way back in 2008, I believe, um, and is presented annually at the Pure Michigan Gover Governor's Conference um, on Tourism. <clears throat> and it, <clears throat> excuse me, and it recognizes um, organizations who preserve, protect, enhance, um, and conserve our historical sites in Michigan. So if you or you know somebody um, who would like to be nominated for that, you can visit our website at michigancaresfortourism.com. Uh, nominations are being accepted until February 29th. Uh, we're also going to drop that link um, into the chat for this webinar as well. Um, also, we're very excited as a board and as Michigan Cares to announce our 2024 um, events for this upcoming season. Uh, we have three uh, events this year that we have lined up for our volunteerism efforts. Uh, the first one is taking place at, uh, April 9th. It's the kickoff to the Premier Michigan Governor's Conference on Tourism in Kalamazoo. Our second one is on May 20th down in Belle Isle on Detroit um, in partnership with the DNR, uh, local Detroit schools, and Visit Detroit to kick off National Tourism Week. And in September, we are bringing back our Adopt a Forest um, program where between September 1st and September 30th, you, your friends, your colleagues um, can get together as a group um, and travel to any of the sites in Michigan uh, where it's been identified that there's been uh, dumping on public and federal uh, forestry lands to help be able to clean that up. Uh, registration for all three of those events will open next week um, on January 10th. And registration can also be found on our website at michigancaresfortourism.com. And we'll drop that um, website into the chat as well. Um, lastly, before I turn this over um, to Rob and Stacy, Wayne and, and Mark, um, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. We plan on doing more of these the rest of the year. So if you do have any suggestions um, on future topics you would like covered, um, please feel free to reach out or drop that information down in the chat box as well. Um, our panelists will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So if you do have any questions, just uh, feel free to, to drop that, those questions into the chat box. Um, and we'll circle back to them at the end of the presentation. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm gonna pass this uh, over to Rob McKay. Rob? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna do quick introductions then we'll get into the uh, presentation. Uh, my name's Robert McKay. I am the relatively new historic architect with the Parks and Recreation Division in uh, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, prior to coming to PRD, I worked at the State Historic Preservation Office for 23 years. So um, that's my background. I'm a lifelong Michigander. So <laughs> I'm Stacy Chorzynski, Director of Archaeology for the DNR out of the Michigan History Center. Um, prior to being at the DNR, I with, was with Rob at the Preservation Office. And um, I have worked with Michigan Cares uh, for Tourism Projects for several years now, helping their uh, wonderful efforts uh, be conscious of uh, cultural resources stewardship while they do their work projects. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Wayne Lusardi. I'm the state of Michigan's maritime archaeologist with the DNR. Uh, I've worked for state the state of Michigan for 21 and a half years, starting with history arts and libraries and then moving over to DNR about a, a decade or so ago. And I've been working with the Michigan Cares group since I think Sturgeon Point, so about eight, eight or so of them that I participated in. So thank you for having us today. And I'm Mark Harvey, the State Archivist of Michigan and the Archives of Michigan. I've been with the archives almost 27 years, and I know that we've we have had sent staff out all over the state to work with Michigan Cares um, on different projects. So I'm excited to be able to share some resources with you today. Thank you.
All right, with that, um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first slide, please, Stacy. Uh, that obviously that's there we go. Um, I, whoa, slow down, you're going faster than me. Um, I, I wanted to start out by saying, uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to tell you anything that you don't already know today. Um, the, the the concept for this came up uh, when there were some discussions about, you know, what kind of nominations have been made for the peer awards in the past and that there isn't a lot of cultural resources, references in those. Um, so as, as a group, Maya and, and uh, myself and uh, Stacy and Wayne kind of thought, well, what if we talked about and kind of reminded people, you know, what we're talking about? So not going to hit anything in, in super depth, but I'm going to try to remind you of those cultural resources. And my job is the above ground stuff. Stacy will handle uh, below ground and, and Wayne will, will talk about um, aquatic resources or, or cultural resources related to maritime industry. Uh, and then uh, obviously Mark is going to talk about documentation that goes along with it. But um, cultural tourism is just, you know, it's a concept I don't think anybody is unfamiliar with. It's the idea that people want to travel and see places and experience places, you know, based on what's unique and integral to those locations and cultures. Uh, so it's, it's not, you know, real complicated. Um, but sometimes the things that you know, we kind of want to remember is that they're they're distinctive. Um, their intellectual, spiritual, and emotional features. That, so it's it's not just it, 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 there's feelings that go along with it. I guess is the point. Um, and then they're interested in art and architecture and and the things that make that community the community. Um, and they're also interested in in the living culture. So I am not going to hit a bunch of museums, which is sort of the standard response to, well, you know, this is sort of the cultural thing. I'm going to try to focus on the, the living and day-to-day -day resources um, that are available and are things that we should look for in our own communities. Next, please. You don't hear the radio ads about the IRS. They tell you to be afraid, to be scared. So a um, couple of key things, um, things that I like to, to remind people um, is that we're, there, we're looking for, or people are generally looking for uh, authenticity, uh, the, the real thing. Um, you know, if you want synthetic, there's lots of places you can go, okay? Um, and there was a time in our country's history where that was how we thought we should deal with historic resources. So we gathered them up and put them in places like Greenfield Village or Walt Disney recreated a three quarter scale downtown. Uh, and, and that was sort of what we thought was the way to do it. And we have learned over time that places in their context and in their own communities are much more valuable. Um, and when we talk about historic resources, I think sometimes there's some confusion about what we're talking about. So I'm gonna clarify from my perspective, um, we're talking about collections, generally collections of buildings, sites, objects, structures, landscapes, things that, that can tell a story. Um, they don't have to be all of those things all at the same time, but generally they will have components that relate to each one of those things. Uh, and this is one of my favorite little things I just, and through Stacy's help and, and with some work in the community. Um, tourism isn't a new thing. Uh, this was a rest station. They call it a tourist camp. I think that's kind of cute. Um, in Lyons uh, that dates back uh, to the teens, 20s. And so we have been promoting through sometimes very unusual, not, not very unusual means, but sometimes very subtle means tourism, uh, you know, as a as a state and a, as a nation, you know, providing someplace a convenient, clean place for a motorist to use a restroom that wasn't, you know, in a in a business or necessarily in a rest uh, service station. So, um, some of these things, like I said, I think are pretty subtle, um, you know. But this happens to still be very much intact and very much there. And unfortunately, in that original upper photograph, those two wonderful little maple trees have recently been removed. So um, kind of disappointed that they took those out. Um, and long ago, those, the gate arch thing uh, was removed, but 
in terms of the sense of the space, it's really remarkable. And when those tr trees were still there, it was it was very interesting because you still had that whole sense of sort of a mini little private campus. So next. So let's talk briefly about what a historic district is. Um, and again, I'm probably not telling anything you know, don't know, but it's a, it's a geographically definable space. Um, it, and that's the important thing is that sometimes people, for example, when we talk about DDAs, they're geographically definable, but they don't always, they're not always visually cohesive. They, they can cover large distances. Historic districts tend to cover a smaller area. They tend to be very visually um, connected. They need not be perfect. Um, these are two pictures of Point City, uh, one circa 1940 and one relatively modern. And while they're approximately the same view, you can see a lot of the same buildings, there's obviously things that have changed over time and that's okay. It, it, you know, we're not looking for perfection. We're looking for the ability to continue to convey that sense of uniqueness uh, and, and um, durability, uh, longevity. So uh, next, please. Now, sometimes in the process of improvement, we make bad decisions. I, I presume some of you are familiar with Niles. Uh, we've got the postcard in the background that, that shows a really interesting view of downtown circa 1910. Um, I assume most of you know that uh, Conair, the aluminum manufacturing company, was located uh, in Niles for a lot of years. And in the 50s, uh, their idea to help uh, improve or modernize downtown was to cover everything up with uh, all that um, brown corrugated aluminum. Um, didn't really have the desired effect uh, and the city was struggling. And so as a, as a collection, a, a cooperative between the city and the merchants, everybody agreed that they would take that corrugated material down and begin an effort of returning the character of the downtown to uh, at least similar to what it was historically. Um, they've made great strides. Are they done? No. Has it taken a long time? Yes. But that's sort of the point. Frequently, when we're talking about historic resources and their contribution to, to tourism and a sense of place, they've changed over time and it takes time to, if I say reverse those changes, um, not always have we appreciated the historic resources and what they can do and the, the unique qualities and characters that they provide to a place. So um, it, it just, sometimes we get overlooked as well. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, Calumet is remarkably well intact, but it too has had difficulties. Um, like every place else, it, you know, it lost some resources. There was an early effort to try to stabilize Main Street that worked fairly well, but then there were some personnel problems. Uh, and then it kind of hit a, another soft spot. And, you know, uh, they they reinitiated some of their focus on downtown um, <clears throat> after there was a fire and there was some threat to some major buildings in downtown. Uh, and the, the Bring Back Calumet uh, program has been largely successful. Again, I don't want to say that it's finished, and I'm not going to tell you that any of these are perfect, but they have done a great deal to try to promote the sense of community and create tourism opportunities that are authentic to the place uh, and that are reflective of the history of the community. Next, please. So we go from the large scale sort of public intervention. Uh, if you've been to uh, Lexington, or I'm sorry, Lawton, there we go. I always get these two confused. Um, this was originally, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, the Cadillac Hotel. Um, it was the premier housing and restauranting uh, facility in the area. Uh, over time, it changed, obviously, substantially, um, became much less attractive. And in the end, it turned into, as with a lot of things, little more than a first floor occupation. 
uh, a private investor felt that they saw an opportunity and uh, decided to do some investigation. They found the early photographs and they did some excavation work of, on the building itself uh, and found that a lot of that material was there. Um, did a major rehabilitation. They combined the Cadillac building proper with the small storefront that you can see slightly to the left as a boutique hotel and eatery. Uh, and it has had a really wonderful impact on you know, the community and the area. It has helped to increase the number of visitors in the area. And it, you know, I, they, they did use a source of public funding. It's a, it was an experienced developer, had done with historic buildings before, worked with the, the federal tax credit program, but the impact is largely based on their private investment. So uh, it can be big areas, it can be one building. So next, please. Um, occasionally, we have resources that we kind of forget about. Um, the Bone Theater was the staple in downtown uh, Albion for a lot of years. It was the theater uh, when you know single screen theaters were competitive. Um, over time, it changed, and over time, it lost out to multiplexes and um, video rental, uh, like a lot of places. Um, a community group of interested individuals got together, leveraged the resources of the community foundation and private funds, were able to acquire the building, were able to rehabilitate it and turn it back into an operating theater. It, it does limited first run movies on the weekends. It's available as a, a speaking venue, an event space. Um, and it has been successful enough, believe it or not, that they, uh, in an adjacent space, created a second theater space. Um, so sometimes these things, you know, are, are resources that are sitting there that people are already interested in. Um, they just need a little love and attention. Uh, and they can, as in this case, have sort of unexpected consequences. I don't think anybody ever really thought there would be that level of demand. But... Um, you give folks a little bit, and sometimes they really connect to that, uh, and it can take off for you. Next, please. This is, I will say, one of the most interesting projects. And I should say, in fairness, all of these examples are things that I worked on while I was with the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, didn't, not trying to promote parks, I'm trying to talk about what are the resources that are out in your communities <clears throat> that you may or may not be aware of. And this is a really classic example of things that a lot of people weren't aware of. Um, this was sort of a forgotten public park and ball venue in uh, Hamtramck that had fallen out of favor with the community but had an absolutely fantastic connection to the Negro League baseball movement in, this, in the country, actually. Um, this was the second home for the Detroit Stars, which was the major Detroit Negro League, Negro League team from the 20s to the 40s. Um, and it had been largely abandoned and a group of community-minded, interested individuals said, this is a shame and we should do something about it. And so they got themselves together. They did receive some grant funding, um, but and you can see on the left what they started with. Um, the stands were falling apart. The roof structure, thankfully, was sound. Uh, that brick <laughs> batting or uh, the causeway wall was falling apart, <clears throat> but they were able to um, pull the research and pull their information and make the argument that, you know, this really is a historic place and it really does deserve attention and, you know, got the community behind them. And now it's back open for, for baseball. It's, it's open uh, the way they designed it. They can play little league to uh, semi pro ball on it. So, um, you know, the, the fact that, Sometimes we forget these things. We do have to kind of go back and look at them again and remind ourselves 
there are some really great things that happened in a lot of our communities uh, that can still be viable and, and celebrated. So uh, we just have to kind of look around us. Next, please. Now, I admit, this is one of my favorite, and there's some people that are going to go, ah, he's one of those train guys. Um, it's not that this is a train. It's the fact that uh, in the upper right, left-hand corner, you see that was the, the 1941, the day that this locomotive was put in service. And it served as a heavy hauler until the 1960s, when it was finally decommissioned in favor of diesel engines. It was transferred to a, a scrapyard, or was going to be transferred to the scrapyard, when a professor at Michigan State thought, this is a pretty cool piece of engineering and should be saved. So he got the <clears throat> train donated to the university where it sat as a static display. Eventually, a group of students thought, hey, it would be kind of cool if this thing could be an excursion train and we could use it to bring people back and forth to MSU football games. So they got the university, they, they started a nonprofit, they got the university to give it to them and they carted it off to um, Owasso to do work on it. It took a lot of years and a lot of people but they were able to, through the cooperation of a grant with uh, MDOT and the uh, National Park Service, they were actually, after 34 years, able to return this locomotive to operating condition. So it's not that it's just an interesting object. It's actually a fantastic example of technology of its day that people can still relate to on a daily basis. Now, if you're a crazy train guy, there's like me, there's all sorts of things about it that are just amazing. But from a general public perspective, this is the Polar Express. This is the, the train and the sounds and the feel that was used to inspire the movie that went along with it is actually the imagery that goes with it. And it's something that's available to everybody, you know, not on a daily basis, unfortunately. I'm sure the, the railroaders would like that, but on a regular basis, and it does bring people to our state and to the community. Um, yes, the book came first. Absolutely. There's the book, then the movie, and then they use the train for the inspiration for everything, uh, for, for what it would look like. Um, you know, and again, this is a this was a long time coming. And are there other locomotives? Sure, there are other locomotives. Are there other operating steam locomotives on this scale? No, there are not. This is one of the only operating steam locomotives of its size in the country. So, um, kind of a cool thing. Um, and again, I, I think sometimes some of these get overlooked when we don't think it's it's not classic. Uh, you know, woods, trees, trails, lakes. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes we have to make sure that we open up our lens a little bit. Um, next, please. And the last one, and I feel a little bad, I'm, I'm stealing a little bit from Wayne. I apologize, Wayne. Um, the SS City of Milwaukee uh, was, is one of the last uh, Grand Trunk rail liners uh, in the state. It has a long and checkered history. It was in, uh, it's, it, when it retired, it went to Frankfurt, and the group has struggled for years to try to get the resources and get the people to return it to a state where it was safe and, and available for the public to tour. Um, in the end, it got evicted from Frankfurt and had to find a new home. It it is now in Manistee. Again, it's been a slow, painful process, but it is now open for tours. And the interesting thing is after a lot of years, it, you, it is available as, a, a over, as overnight accommodation. Um, they're small rooms. It's, I mean, it's, you're staying on a ship. Um, but it's another way that through time, patience, and perseverance, uh, and a different kind of tourism opportunity has been able to be created, um, not without pain and suffering, I'll admit. But I think that the the outcome um, is, is really quite wonderful. Uh, eventually, the group was also able to get a retired uh, Coast Guard cutter. So now they have, they have two vessels in their collection. 
Uh, and, you know, it, it's just another way that we can encourage a broader diversity of folks uh, to come visit our state. So, um, like I said, I'm not sure that I told you anything you don't already know. I just hope that I was able to uh, point out some some things that are, are lurking around in the background and uh, you know remind you that there's more sometimes, I think, than we give ourselves credit for. Uh, and I encourage you when you're talking about uh, opportunities, you know, what, what are some of those things in and around your communities that uh, you can help promote? So thank you. And Stacy is next. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So uh, jumping off from where Rob was, uh, archaeology tells us that people have been living in Michigan for nearly 14,000 years. And some tribes will tell you that their ancestors have been here since time immemorial. There are that there is no end to the cultural resources, the heritage and the history that we overlook and have yet to not just uh, even fully understand or identify, but also celebrate and interpret. So um, I'm gonna blast through some uh, case studies and some um, subjects to get your juices flowing about so many of the uh, overlooked heritage, uh, aspects of heritage that, um, are, are terrific to include uh, in tourism projects. Um, real quick about archeology, span people think that it's you know, often a bit obscure, something they see on TV, nothing that's really happening in their yard. Most people think about archeology, span it happens over in, ah, so it happens over in Egypt, you know, but they don't realize that people were living in Michigan 9,000 years before the Great Pyramids were built. You know, um, the Society for American Archaeology did a survey last January, and they found that for the most part, people in the United States really care about archaeology. Um, they say it's important. They say that it's important to our nation, to their community, to um, our, our collective identities, and that um, archaeological resources should be identified and, and, and protected. Most people get their education and information about our distant history uh, or archaeology through television, which is uh, not always the best way to get accurate information, museums, schoolwork, movies. But, um, you know, uh, in addition to this, a smaller percentage, but a growing percentage, get good information by visiting the heritage sites. And there's lots of ways you can do that in Michigan. Um, uh, for example, we have a system of historic state parks that reach statewide all the way up from Fort Wilkins Historic State Park at the tip of the Keweenaw to the Sanilac Petroglyphs in the Thumb, um, our flagship museum where I'm sitting right now, the Michigan History Center in Lansing, um, uh, Maritime Heritage Center in Alpena affiliated with NOAA where Wayne works. All of these historic state parks, not only do they sit um, in a, you know, their historic context, they interpret local history, they are filled with archaeological artifacts and education. Um, and so uh, they are um, also uh, intimately tied to their communities. Um, if you've been around Michigan Cares for Tourism for a while, you have visited some of these sites in the annual uh, collective uh, projects that we do. So you can see with the bus tours and, and the local tours, how these sites um, are nestled in these communities that have so much to offer. So connecting these special historic places um, to the wider community um, is something um, that I think is done well, and we're always looking to improve. You've got uh, sort of your, uh, you know, when you think about archaeology in Michigan, the most classic case study for tourism is Mackinac State Historic Parks, and particularly Fort Michelin Mackinac on the south side of the Straits in Mackinac City. Um, we could easily imagine that where the fort sits now could have been condos, could be a shopping center, right? No, but early on, it was recognized that the fort location was there, and it was entirely recreated based on archaeology. So it was the presence in mind of mind and the forethought to uh, protect this site, preserve it, and then archaeologically study it. And now it's one of the largest tourist destinations in our region. And it's, it's a world-class site um, of international importance. And um, as anyone who's been to Mackinac City or the Straits, 
uh, the island visited any of Mackinac State Historic Parks, they are embedded in every aspect of uh, the local community. And they really do um, a, a superb job in linking heritage um, to a uh, tourist economy, uh, visitation and celebration of local heritage. A project that's also a fort that you may not know about is down in Niles, Michigan. Um, the Fort St. Joseph Archaeological Project is a combination between the city of Niles, Western Michigan University, and they, um, uh, uh, this is sort of a, a time warp, you know, almost century later case study of what happened at Fort Michelin-Mackinac, where the local community recognized, um, and archaeologists realized that there was this um, fort that was supposed to be on the river, uh, in the city, and no one knew exactly where it was, so they embarked on uh, um, uh, an expedition to relocate the location of the fort and interpret it to the public. And so they uh, found the fort indeed with the help of Western Michigan University. They have annual events. There are archaeological field schools. There are community archaeology days. They do an annual open house with reenactors. They get oodles of visitors. This has also been um, the artifacts from this project are also on exhibit at the museum, the local historical museum in Niles. So this is, um, you know, the city took on this ambitious project with Western Michigan University archaeologists, and it is such a draw for Niles. Um, uh, it has really done a terrific thing. So not only do you get the benefit of identifying, studying, and preserving um, an amazingly important 17th century fort archaeological site, you also um, use it in um, appropriate, respectful ways to uh, encourage tourism, and it certainly does that. Um, archaeological resources, some may be especially appropriate and desirable for public interpretation like Fort St. Joseph, like uh, Colonial Michelin Mackinac, um, but others may not. So when you're looking at any kind of local heritage site, especially if it's archaeological or indigenous tribal in nature, it's important to consider a few things. One is a resource um, strong enough or can it be stabilized enough to be vi visitable? Um, one thing we don't want to do, whether it's a historic building, bridge, archaeological site, shipwreck, you name it, is love something to death. So if you're going to incorporate heritage into your tourism, make sure it's something that's hardy enough uh, to, to stand up to that much public love. Also, you want to make sure it's cu culturally appropriate. There are some heritage sites uh, for tribes, for example, where it's very sensitive, they're sacred sites, and they're not appropriately to be publicly interpreted. Um, so it's important to consult with descendant communities, as well as other stakeholders, on what's the right stuff to highlight to the public, what is the correct, accurate, uh, authentic messaging to provide of it, uh, for it, and how can resources be preserved uh, while they're being well-loved. And uh, if you're interested in archaeology and tourism, I recommend going to the Advisory Council for Historic Preservation, ACHP, has a policy statement on archaeology, heritage, tourism, and education. And frankly, um, you know, it might sound a little uh, fringe to you, but uh, archaeological and heritage tourism is growing in Michigan, and I expect to see quite a bit more of it. Uh, a good... Uh, a uh, town example is in the city of Saginaw, the Castle Museum of County uh, Saginaw County History has one of the only local museum archaeological exhibits in the state. Um, most of them are at state or university museums, but um, Castle Museum of Saginaw really it, uh, knocks it out of the park. Um, this is, uh, you know, the Castle Museum is a destination in and of itself because of its breathtaking architecture, but also because of its historical heritage and archaeological content. So people will cross the street to, to hit Saginaw to go to this museum, hit a restaurant, and, uh, and, and have a good time. Um, many of you probably work with one of or more of our, uh, the 12 federally recognized tribes in Michigan. Um, they're interested in tourism uh, and economic development, like everybody else. Uh, they have some truly uh, world-class museums and cultural offerings 
uh, to connect to. For example, in Mount Pleasant is the Zeebwing Center of Anishinaabe Culture and Lifeways. It is the Midwest's premier um, Anishinaabe Indigenous Museum. Um, it is uh, uh, across the street from their casino, uh, nestled in other uh, shopping districts nearby, near Central Michigan University. And this uh, cultural center and museum is really sort of a, a hub for a lot of activity in Mount Pleasant. And then throughout the year, you get tribal events that are appropriate for the public to join in, including um, this is a, a photo from the 2023 uh, Machibinashiwish or Gun Lake Tribe uh, Potawatomi Powwow. Uh, and uh, so there's just so many exciting uh, tribal events um, as people have lived in Michigan for as long as they have, the best way to expose your visitors to an authentic um, uh, and better understanding of Indigenous history is to visit a tribal museum, cultural center, or a, a public event. One of the uh, great ways to move people across your terrain and give them a lot of heritage information is the use of heritage trails. So heritage trails is a program in the Michigan History Center and um, it is statewide. So up from the Iron Ore Heritage Trail in the Ute um, to the Huron River uh, Water Trail in Southeast Michigan, these trails give great opportunities to not only do outside recreating, to um, you know uh, enjoy natural resources, but also interpret local heritage on the way. Um, in heritage science, um, you know, it's always nice if you can link to other places in their community. So um, whether you're talking about a historic tavern or a downtown historic district, if it's connected to your vision of the heritage on your trail, maybe when people, they're done biking, hiking for the day, they're going to go into those districts and those historic uh, portions of your community to see sort of follow up on that signage they've seen along this um, along the trail and um, get more uh uh, more out of it. So heritage trails are great for content along a corridor, but they can also link to other places in the community to give people inspiration to visit places beyond the trail. If you're interested, here is uh, the link to uh, the heritage trails programs. And also who doesn't love the green and gold markers? These are, you know, uh, iconic state historical markers. This was a program that started in 55. We have over 1700 markers across the state, even out of state and in other countries where Michigan history is relevant. But these are important because they mark, um, you know, the, the, the heritage, the identity of, of, of a place. And dedication ceremonies are a great way to tell your town, we have a new lasting resource for tourism. There is a marker app where you can, um, you know, GIS, you know, see where all the markers are, see if you are near one. Um, you can do them thematically, such as lighthouses, or uh, sites along the Michigan Freedom Trail or pick a time period, but know the historical markers in your yard. And if you don't have many, or if you're not really connecting the dots well, contact the marker program. Markers are a great way. Every, from, from day trips, visiting markers, to Pokemon stops. Marker, people go bananas over markers. And so um, I encourage your communities to see how you're fixed for markers. See if there's something that's being overlooked. And then, uh, of course, uh, archaeologists uh, love the history of foodways. We love the history of food and beverages, how people have grown food, collected food, harvested food, made food, uh, uh, brewed beer, you name it. You know, food and culinary history is in our heritage in Michigan. And we have some amazing historic uh, restaurants, factories, foods um, that are worth connecting. Um, I uh, laughingly call this boutiquing because one of my ideas of a perfect day is to visit a historic community, check out their historic buildings, take piles of pictures, shop local, go to local antique stores and visit a brewery, preferably in a historic building. So, you know, we've got so much of that to offer. Um, I will end by uh, 
pointing you, the National Trust for Historic Preservation um, uh, is an entity that um, you, you may have heard of, and they do uh, an assortment of wonderful projects. But they also have a website, and I'll throw the link in the chat, about cultural heritage tourism. And uh, we're going over it really quick today, but they talk about different steps for collaboration, finding the resources and, and the right fit uh, for your community, how to make programs vibrant, how to um, focus on authenticity and quiet and quality, what makes your community special and uh, gives it a sense of place. But also while you're doing all of that, celebrating of resources, how to preserve and protect them. Um, I would say, uh, and, and this goes for all the content we're delivering today, there's a few entities you should know about if you don't already. Um, beyond the Michigan History Center and the resources that the DNR can help you with, um, the Michigan Historic Preservation Network is the statewide historic preservation nonprofit. They're based in downtown. They're based in Old Town Lansing. They um, have wonderful programs that can assist communities in identifying historic resources. Um, and then, of course, your state historic preservation office has the master files of all reported heritage sites in the state. They can help you identify things that you have. They can also talk to you about designation programs, listing sites in the National Register of Historic Places, um, incentives, tax incentives. We have a state historic preservation tax credit, as well as there is a federal one. They can talk to you about those financial incentives, incentives that can really help get a project off the ground. And then um, it goes without saying that local historical societies um, have the goods too. So if you're not connected with them yet, um, I encourage you to do so. And I'll hand it over to Wayne. All right. Thank you, Stacy. So we all know that Michigan is surrounded by water and we all know that water and recreation and tourism have always gone hand in hand. What we probably don't think about, though, is how much of Michigan is actually underwater. About a third of the state is literally submerged in the four Great Lakes that surround the state of Michigan. And consequently, there are huge amounts of maritime resources that are available in Michigan along the shorelines under the waters of the Great Lakes uh, that are open and available for tourism and recreation. What I'm going to example today is by no means a comprehensive list. There are many thousands of times more of what uh, opportunities there are throughout the state than what I'm going to talk about in, in the next seven or eight minutes. So next slide, please. I'm going to start with historic vessels. We have a lot of big ships, small ships, fish tugs, uh, Mackinac boats, and other kinds of things all over the state that are often affiliated with recreational and tourism destinations. One of the big ones up in the Straits, a uh, hand uh, throw away from Mich Fort Michelin Mackinac and the bridge in Mackinac Island and all the beautiful fudge shops that are in Mackinac City is the Icebreaker uh, Mackinac. This was had a long and very glorious career as an icebreaker and a search and rescue vessel in the Great Lakes uh, used by the United States Coast Guard until it was retired and turned into a museum ship. Next, please. If you want to visit a post-World War II destroyer, you can go to Bay City, Saginaw, and where the USS Edson is uh, permanently moored. This saw service with the United States Navy through the Vietnam era. And ships like the Mackinac and the Edson and some of the others that I'm going to show are available for tours, for private tours, for weddings, even for overnight stays. And they draw a lot of people into the local communities. Next, please. Uh, the same is true of the USS Silver Size. This is a Manitowoc uh, built submarine that saw service in the Second World War that is now permanently moored at Muskegon. Next. And the lightship Huron that was literally a floating lighthouse that is on the waterfront of the St. Clair River in Port Huron. This boat is over 100 years old and has a historic marker, is open and available for tours, and is part of a maritime cultural landscape that occurs all along the waterfront of Port Huron. And it's not very far from a memorial seen here on the left that was dedicated to the Tuskegee Airmen, the first African-American aviators that were trained by the United States military to fly during the Second World War, many of who trained in Michigan and were lost here in Lake Huron and in Lake St. Clair. Next, please. And then you have mobile 
historic vessels. Sometimes they're historic reproduction. Sometimes they're very old vessels like the, the brig Niagara that saw service in the War of 1812 or what's left of that original brig. And they do festivals all across the state and all across the region. There is a tall ship festival somewhere in Michigan every summer. And it bounces around between places like Bay City and Alpena and Muskegon and Ludington, et cetera. But there's always something going on with tall ships. And whenever a group of tall ships are in town, it's a gigantic tourism draw. Next, please. We have more lighthouses in Michigan than any other state. There are about 150 or so that are distributed all across the water lines or the uh, shorelines of the Great Lakes. And very many of these are linked into these kind of circle tours where you can go from one lighthouse to the next to the next. Most of the lighthouses in Michigan are open for at least public viewing, if not full on, uh, you know, climbing right up to the light tower. Next, please. A lot of these lighthouses are affiliated with other kinds of maritime resources, like moss to a flame, it seems like there are always shipwrecks in front of lighthouses. Um, there are collections of shipwreck and other historic materials that get kind of accumulated in these lighthouse complexes, like Roger City, the 40 mile point light that has the pilot house of the calcite. Uh, scrapping a historic vessel like calcite ultimately destroys that vessel, but sometimes local historic communities and groups uh, go through an effort for the preservation of at least components of that vessel, and they put it on public display so that it's available for all of us in perpetuity. Next, please. Right outside of the 40 mile point lighthouse at Rogers City is a shipwreck that Joseph Fay washed up on the beach. A lot of times when something like this is sitting on the beach, it looks like a threat. It's got lots of nails sticking out of it. It looks like a liability problem, or it looks like a great opportunity to teach about archeology, span to teach about maritime heritage, to teach about uh, cultural resource preservation. And that's the case here at 40 Mile Point and places like Ludington State Park and other places uh, along the shoreline where there are beach wrecks. There are about 1500 or so shipwrecks in Michigan waters probably 80% or so of those are in waters less than 30 feet because they're coming aground, they're coming ashore. And consequently, they are available for public viewing. You don't have to be a diver to visit shipwrecks in Michigan. And a lot of these shipwrecks are tied together in these heritage trail kind of setups like we have here on the US 23 heritage trail that extends basically from the Straits all the way down to Saginaw Bay. Next, please. We have other shipwrecks that are very easily accessible, some that are off of state parks and other public lands uh, that can be viewed by paddle, paddle boarders, kayakers, boaters, that sort of thing. Again, you don't have to be a diver to see a lot of these. If you want to stay home and just cruise the shorelines on Google Earth or some other aerial imagery sites, you'll be amazed on how many shipwrecks you see in the shallow waters around Michigan. Next, please. A lot of these shipwrecks are also uh, accessible through glass bottom boat tours. This really began up in Munising uh, almost 50 years ago, where you have a boat like the Bermuda that's sitting right offshore. It's in very shallow water. It's perfectly intact. And you can put a glass bottom boat over the top of it, look down through the viewports and experience this kind of maritime heritage firsthand. We started operations here in Alpena at the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center with a glass bottom boat a little over 10 years ago. And it brings tens of thousands of visitors out to these shallow water shipwrecks. Next, please. And then, of course, there's scuba diving to, to get to all of the really, really super cool wrecks. The deeper wrecks are usually more intact, like the Cornelia Windiate here. It sank about 150 years ago, and it's literally sitting at 190 feet of water with the mast still up and the rigging still in the mast and cabins that you can go inside and see plates stacked on the shelves. And this is something that is, is a very special experience that is obviously, um, in the, you, know, you know, you have to be a diver in order uh, to get access to these kind of deeper water wrecks, but you can snorkel shallow water wrecks and you can kind of dive at any level in between. And beginning in the 1960s, when scuba diving became popular in the Great Lakes, uh, dive shops and dive charter boats started operating all over Michigan and, and carry on to this day and draw in people from all over the world because of the preservation characteristics 
of the Great Lakes and the fresh cold water that help to preserve these shipwrecks. The shipwrecks around Michigan are clustered generally because of navigational problems, hazards. Uh, and so you have a lot of areas that were designated beginning in about 1980 as state underwater preserves. And there are a lot of them, there are about 14 or so of these marine protected areas where shipwrecks are again, grouped geographically and they are preserved uh, from salvage and from looting uh, more so than in general areas along the lake bottoms. Next please. One of these preserves, Thunder Bay, started as an underwater preserve, continues to be a state underwater preserve, but what became the first freshwater marine sanctuary in the United States back in uh, a little over 20 years ago. And in 2005, the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center opened at Thunder Bay. And it's a wonderful place to visit and learn about not only the local shipwrecks, but all of the area's maritime heritage. And you can see a lot of maritime museums across the state uh, really survive on their education and their outreach programs. And here in a left image, for example, is 4th of July. We have a maritime festival here every year since 2002. And it draws in between seven and 10,000 people just on you know, a, an afternoon on the 4th of July every year. And we have events like cardboard boat races and rubber ducky races and those kinds of things uh, that are sort of tangentially uh, related to maritime endeavors. Uh, just in a couple of weeks, we're hosting, I think it's the 11th or so annual Great Lakes Maritime Film Festival. And again, we have filmmakers and film presenters come in from all over the world to present on usually maritime or ocean related kinds of um, films that are uh, from projects all over the world. Next, please. There are, in addition to the marine protected areas in the form of state on water preserves, there are national parks that all have shipwrecks in them and all interpret those shipwrecks at Isle Royal, at Pictured Rocks, and at Sleeping Bear Dunes, for example, where you can get walking tours or glass bottom boat tours or diving tours of the area's shipwrecks. Next, please. Probably one of the most heavily visited uh, places in Northeast Upper Peninsula, Michigan, is the Whitefish Point, the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum there. And people go to that area of the state to see the locks at Sault Ste. Marie, which are arguably very maritime oriented, obviously. They look at Tacoma Falls, but they go to Paradise to go to this museum. And they have tens of thousands of visitors there in a very short season every year. Next, please. And the reason that you go to Whitefish Point is to see the remains of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The bell is exhibited there, some artifacts are exhibited there. And in addition to a lot of the other shipwreck materials that are owned by the state of Michigan and loaned to the museum, uh, people really migrate there to look at uh, and to pay respect to the loss of Edmund Fitzgerald. Next, please. The Michigan Maritime Museum down at South Haven is another beautiful complex. It has a, an incredible small boat building program there where you can get involved uh, on a weekend where you can build small boats like prams or, or Mackinac boats. And people can kind of sign up for these kinds of programs. They also have living history where they have schooners and sloops and other historic vessels that are available for charter. I've been on weddings uh, on these boats uh, and they do overnight accommodations, research cruises and other kinds of things. Next please. And of course, up at Mackinac, part of the complex there at the fort at Michel Mackinac, it includes the old Mackinac Point Lighthouse that's on the south side of the bridge. And right next to that, they have a shipwreck museum there that just opened up a few years ago, and it exhibits uh, artifacts and models of the area's shipwrecks throughout the straits. Next, please. <laughs> Of course, maritime museums are all over the state and include at Belle Isle, which is one of the most incredible maritime museums in all of the Great Lakes region, at the Great Lakes uh, Dawson Museum on Belle Isle. And it really features the maritime heritage, not just of historic times, but of uh, the uh, pre-contact periods and working all the way up through the early part of the 20th century. Next. And you have in Detroit, another museum that's not traditionally a maritime museum at all, but it's the Charles Wright Museum of African American History. And it right currently is the repository for uh, an exhibit 
for the National Museum of the Tuskegee Airmen, where it's showing pieces of an airplane that was found in Lake Huron and that is being in the, in the process of being recovered and conserved. And it's temporarily housed in a gallery at the Charles Wright. Next, please. So in summation, really, there are just tons of ways to get involved and to get out outdoors and to look at the and experience the rich, incredible maritime heritage of Michigan, of the Great Lakes. Whether you're a diver, whether you're a paddle boarder, or you just want to kind of do museums or even online kind of resources, there are so many opportunities for tourism and recreation here related to the water. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. So I want to spend our last few moments here um, sharing a few thoughts that might connect the content shared by Rob and Stacy and Wayne. And I think it's probably best summed up is if, you know, if these um, projects and ideas and content are interesting to you, you're, you're going to need resources. So if you want to cook a dish, you need ingredients. And the archives of Michigan is a wonderful source of historical information um, that you could use to, to um, help your project. A lot of the images, you know, I, I sat here through the presentation looking at a lot of these images thinking, oh, I've seen that before, or oh, I've seen that before. Um, and so it's just a reaffirmation that, that those resources are vital to completing your project. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways to get information. Um, and I will, say this later, but the Archives of Michigan obviously isn't the only source of, of historical information in the state. We might be the best kept secret because we don't do a great job of um, building awareness, but I have a few things I want to share with you today. The first is a website we run, michiganology.org, which is to date um, contains around 6 million historic records, and it can be anything from postcards of every town and city in Michigan to, to city charters, city plans, um, architectural drawings. You, know, you see the list here I have up on the screen. Um, it really runs a wide gamut. And we're always working to, to improve the search functions on it. It's, you know, it's always a challenge to try to ma manage millions of records and, and be able to pinpoint finding the exact one. So we're always working on that, but I would just direct you if you're just looking for general information, historical information about your community, this is a great um, great resource to, to begin your search with. And next slide, please. The other <clears throat> way to, to dive into the archives is to go to the homepage, and these links should be popping up in the, in the chat. If you go to the, our government homepage, there is a link down um, on the bottom here that says search the archives online catalog. And if you click on that link, you'll see our next slide. It's actually the um, catalog image. Can we have next slide, please? There it is. This is just a general search window for, this is a collection level search. Well, Michigan Algae will get you down to digital item level, um, You'll actually see images of, of maps and photographs and documents at Michiganology. This search will, searches across collections. So you'll see, um, you know, a collection describing all the architectural drawings of lighthouses in Michigan in our collections. And this basically is a great um, first step before you come visit us in person to see if we have something that would be of interest to you. We also have research guides that are set up by county. So if you just want to see what's in your county and just filter out the rest, you can you can look at those as well. Next slide. By all means, the the resources we have online, you know, it goes without saying those aren't the only resources available to you. Over my career, time and time again, I've always gone back to Library of Congress's uh, website. This has been called. A number of things over the years, um, American Memory Project for a long time, and now it's just Library of Congress collections. And I've highlighted some of the things I've found most useful, uh, especially when I have gone and given talks in a particular community. I'll go right in and to the Historic American Building Survey, and um, 
and do a search to see what they have a community. A very short story, I gave a talk in Stockbridge, Michigan about historic resources. And um, I didn't think I found a lot, but there was a, a historic American building survey on the water tower there. And so I put it into my presentation thinking, oh my gosh, these people are gonna think I'm nuts because I put a water tower in my presentation on historic resources. And afterwards, um, several people came up to me and said how much they appreciated I put the water tower in there because it's a rite of passage in that town to climb, when you graduate from high school, you climb up the water tower. So you never know, you never know what um, people consider as their historic resource. Um, local libraries, historical societies, and regional universities. So, you know, U of M, I'm not, I'm going to leave somebody out, but, you know, the university or college in your area or the public library in your area likely will have local history collections. Next slide. But nothing really um, can be a substitute for visiting in person. The archives is open six days a week and um, we have staff on site. You really don't need to know what you're looking for. I mean, honestly, we have people that come in and and have a person's name, or they say, I want to find out everything you have on a particular community. And you essentially have um, a professional researcher at your disposal, and we're there to help you. So I realize my portion of this is the shortest, but really I just wanted to tie together where you can find the raw materials for um, investigating cultural tourism opportunities for your, for your community. So thank you. I'm not sure who's going to summarize. Stacey? I, have, I am right here. Okay. So thank you, Mark, uh, and the whole team from the DNR for a great presentation. Uh, we're, we're about three minutes over one o'clock. Um, does anybody have any questions? We didn't see anything pop up in the chat, uh, but Maya from the DNR uh, and Rob have put in a number of links there uh, to share for resources as well. Uh, we will be sure to forward you those links as well in a follow-up email. Um, along with a, a survey as well. So again, thank you so much for joining us. This is our first uh, Michigan Cares for Tourism Lunch and Learn. Uh, we're looking to do several more throughout the year as well. So your feedback and suggestions for a content type would be greatly appreciated. So please feel free to reach out. Um, are there any last questions for any of our panelists um, at all from the group? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, so this is recorded. I will be up on the Michigan Cares for Tourism um, YouTube site sometime within the next couple of days. Any questions? Yeah. All right. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you.